neurologist specialized in urological oncology and my assistant professor of Scott Department of Urology at Baylor College of Medicine. And I have a pleasure to moderate today's program. So first of all, I want to extend a warm welcome to all attendees and also our physicians connecting from Latin America, the Middle East and the United States. As part of our mission, we promote medical knowledge through educational programs, the International Center at Baylor St. Luke's in Houston, Texas, in collaboration with Baylor College of Medicine, is honored to host our ninth international virtual roundtable to our network of physicians, medical societies, and international medical community. Today, we have a very relevant and timely topic. It's managing high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer in the BCG shortage era. The objectives of tonight's activity are to understand treatment options with no or limited supply of BCG, and to describe the role of radical cystectomy for patients with a high and very high risk disease. Very well. So our program today will start first with a, a lecture presentation by our speaker, Dr. Seth Lerner. Through his presentation, please feel free to submit questions via the chat box located at the bottom right of your screen. And please feel free to submit questions either in English or Spanish. Hablamos Español. After the presentation, we will open the virtual roundtable with questions. And then we will uh, uh, take comments and considerations from our panelists, our speaker, and also we're going to open discussion to the audience. Before introducing our speaker for this afternoon, I would like to welcome our Latin American panelist who join us after the presentation with his opinion and comments. Let's please welcome Dr. Dagoberto Molina Polo from Mexico. Dr. Dagoberto Molina Polo is a graduate of the Mexican School of Medicine of La Salle University. He completed his medical residency in general surgery at the Hostel General of Mexico to later perform a subspecialty in urology at the National Medical Center November 20th. He is certified in robotic surgery by Memorial Hermann Surgical Innovations and Robotic Institute in the city of Houston, Texas. His research work is focused on the management and treatment of urological cancer and among these, carcinoma of the prostate, bladder, testicle, and kidney. The areas of comprehensive urological care that he handles include oncological urology, endourological surgery, laparoscopic surgery, urolithiasis, erectile dysfunction, male infertility, female urology, and reconstructive urological surgery. He has published numerous articles in international recognized journals within the specialty and is author of the book, 20 Responses to Prostate Cancer. His professional practice is located at the ABC Medical Center Observatory Campus in Mexico City. Welcome very much, Dr. Molina. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We'll be connecting with you right after the lecture to obtain your observations and points of view. Now, it is my privilege to introduce my mentor, my colleague, and our special speaker for tonight, Dr. Seth Lerner. Dr. Seth Lerner is professor of urology, and he holds the Beth and Dave Swam Chair in Neurological Oncology and the Scott Department of Urology, Baylor College of Medicine. He is the director of Urological Oncology and the Multidisciplinary Bear Cancer Program and the Faculty Group Practice Medical Director for the Urology Clinic. Dr. Lerner earned his medical degree from Baylor College of Medicine. He completed a surgical internship at Virginia Mason Hospital in Seattle and returned to Baylor for his residency training. He completed a two-year fellowship at University of South California in Urological Oncology and Reconstructive Surgery under Peter Jones and Don Skinner before returning to join full-time Baylor faculty in 1992. His clinical practice, education, and research activities are devoted to urologic oncology and particularly lower and upper tract urothelial cancer. Dr. Lerner is author of over 190 peer-reviewed articles, and he's the co-editor of a comprehensive textbook of bladder cancer. He's also founding uh, co-editor-in-chief of the Bladder Cancer Journal. Welcome, Dr. Lerner. Thank you very much for your participation in this program. And let's please go ahead with your presentation. Great, thanks, uh, Gadi and uh, Godoy and Dr. Molina, welcome. Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, and um, 
So let me, I'm gonna share my screen. So hopefully everybody can see this. Alex will tell me if there's a problem. And let me do that. Okay, so welcome everybody from uh, Baylor St. Luke's uh, Medical Center, our home in the Texas Medical Center. Baylor and St. Luke's have this great uh, joint venture and partnership uh, in conjunction with the Dan L. Duncan Com Com Comprehensive Cancer Center. And we're happy in the Department of Urology to play an active role uh, in uh, both organizations, all three organizations. So um, these are my disclosures, if I could the slides that's not good okay hang on just a second sorry video here ah, okay um let me go back to sharing we test drove this beforehand and it worked great okay anyway so uh, my topic is uh managing uh, high-risk, high-grade, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer during the BCG shortage. I think everybody is aware that there, there really is a global shortage of BCG. I'll explain sort of why that's uh, happened and, um, and some of the challenges and opportunities that we have uh, during uh, management. So these are my uh, disclosures. Um, I will be referring to a clinical trial in the Southwest Oncology Group that's supported by JBL, which makes the Tokyo uh, strain of BCG, um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitors, just very briefly mentioning clinical trials. Uh, and so we have both a clinical trial relationship with Genentech, and I do some consulting, but I'll point out along the way any other potential uh, conflicts, financial conflicts of interest. So this is what I'm going to cover in uh, about the next 20, 25 minutes. I'll be efficient, um, and uh, let's, why don't we just get right into it. Um, so uh, what happened? Uh, so um, at least in North America, uh, there were two strains of BCG, TICE, which we currently have available through uh, Merck and uh, the Connaught strain, which was produced by Sanofi Pasteur in Canada. They went offline in 2012 and then closed permanently in 2017. So we had a major supplier offline now for eight years. Merck stepped up. Uh, but has had um, intermittent issues uh, with their production, though none in the recent uh, past. And they manufacture Tice in a single plant in the U.S. and distribute to over uh, 70 countries. Uh, the U.S. market was 28% of the total product. They have increased their production by more than 100%. And, uh, but despite that, um, demand has clearly outstripped supply. And they began an allocation distribution uh, back in January 2019. Um, the, uh, a number of stakeholders that I've listed here in the bottom uh, got together and developed a joint statement that uh, first came out in February of uh, last year and then updated just recently. And I think that this actually, the next two slides are probably some of the most important messages I can convey. So, uh, and we'll talk about all of these, uh, but low risk disease, BCG should never be used. Those patients basically get perioperative chemotherapy and follow-up. Intravesical chemotherapy should be the first line option for patients with intermediate risk uh, disease. Um, and then uh, BCG should be uh, uh, reserved for patients with high risk disease and particularly those who are BCG naive to try to get full strength in. And if uh, supply issues restrict that, then you can dose reduce, though that's not ideal for patients with, um, who are BCG naive. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about maintenance therapy. Um, and uh, maintenance should only be used as long as we can prioritize induction for BCG naive patients. And again, just high risk, which is high grade disease by definition. Um, there are a bunch of alternative chemotherapy regimens, and I'll discuss some of that as we go along and talk. And of course, radical cystectomy continues to be perhaps a treatment of choice for the highest risk patients. But uh, in other times of BCG shortage, there's data to show that cystectomy has increased in use for patients who otherwise might be able to be treated with intravesical uh, therapy. Uh, just an update uh, from Merck. Uh, I think it's safe to say that they're producing at the maximum of their manufacturing capacity. 
and they've reiterated as recently as um, this month, um, <coughs> excuse me, that it continues to be a top priority of theirs and they have a plan moving forward uh, to try to increase uh, production. That's the, what this uh, bullet point indicates. Um, and they're working collaboratively with both the FDA, European health authorities and all the stakeholders. Um, and I think we can rest assured that their commitment is very strong, even though I think we all realize mm -hmm. it's a very small part of their pharmaceutical uh, business. So uh, BCG dose reduction is very safe. Sometimes less BCG is better. You can get a cytokine response with as little as one one hundredth of a standard dose. Uh, I hope that most of us are used to dose reduction in the face of toxicity. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about um, how to do that in the current environment where you're trying to manage a limited supply of BCG. At least in uh, the United States, uh, the AUA has a, a split dosing policy. There's what we refer to as a J code that allows one to bill for the uh, portions of a BCG vial. The problem has been that the carriers, the insurance carriers haven't quite figured out a way to um, allow us to charge patients and get reimbursed for split uh, vials. Although some practices have figured out a way to do that. Um, the FDA has continued to work with Merck quite closely. They're also very interested in looking at uh, bringing additional or different strains into the marketplace. I'll mention one potential example of that. And uh, this is just uh, what's on the FDA website uh, as of a couple of days ago in terms of the current situation with uh, uh, Tice BCG, essentially the shortage is ongoing. And quite frankly, I don't think any of us see necessarily an end in sight anywhere in the near future, uh, but perhaps in the long uh, term. So it's worthwhile to just um, talk briefly about risk stratification. I like using the European Association of Urology uh, guidelines because it's quite easy to remember. A low risk patient has a solitary small TA, low grade tumor, generally first occurrence, they don't need anything else done uh, except uh, perioperative chemotherapy. High risk patients or any patients with high grade disease and intermediate is everything in the middle, which essentially is multifocal recurrent TA low grade. Just to understand the subtle differences, the AUA includes smaller uh, TA uh, high grade tumors that are solitary and T1 low grade, which is a rare entity, but it does occur and a larger uh, uh, large TA low-grade tumors are also included in um, the high-risk uh, patients. And then we'll talk a little bit about at the end of the very high-risk patients in terms of those patients needing upfront uh, cystectomy. So this is also uh, lends itself to a very easy risk-adapted treatment. We've already talked about uh, the treatment for low-risk, intermediate risk. We'll talk about perioperative chemotherapy plus uh, induction and maintenance. Uh, and then high-risk is are the classic indications for intravesical BCG plus maintenance. Um, so this is some nice work from uh, Seema Porton when she was a fellow at MD Anderson. She's now at UCSF and Ashish Kamat, um, where they looked at different ways of giving maintenance uh, BCG. And essentially the only maintenance protocol that has been shown to be effective in terms of reducing recurrence and progression would be the Southwest Oncology Group uh, protocol, which is uh, uh, weekly for three weeks at months three, six, and every six months out to three years, giving one install installation every three months or every month, or reinduction is not uh, uh, the same and essentially is not as effective as uh, induction BCG alone. So it's really the, the SWOG protocol that is where the money is in terms of maintenance BCG. Um, the EMRTC trial, uh, compared full dose versus low dose and one year versus three year in both intermediate and high risk patients. And uh, what the take home message here is that uh, full dose for three years seemed to provide the biggest bang for the buck in terms of high risk disease. But you can see uh, here that the one third dose came very close. So the message here in managing BCG uh, supply is that uh, dose reduction uh, in order to be able to keep a patient on maintenance therapy, if that's if they're continuing to maintain a complete response is probably just as effective uh, in the long run compared to no BCG. 
Um, so this is a nice uh, slide from Chad Rich uh, at, uh, in, in Florida showing uh, how you can split a dose of BCG. So we have a vial of Tice uh, on the left. Um, it's reconstituted to 50 mLs, as you all know, and you can split it into three syringes. So you would essentially be able to take a vial and use it for three different patients within your practice in order to be able to continue, say, maintenance uh, therapy. Um, and uh, it can be kept in the fridge uh, and um, administered to, now you have to have these three patients sort of coordinated in the clinic because uh, uh, BCG will, viability won't be maintained for very long. Uh, Chad says here two hours, Ashish Kamat says it's probably good for a little bit longer, but that's what the label says. So the FDA label says it's good for two hours. So if you can coordinate having multiple patients ready for intravesical installation, you can make a, a full dose of BCG go between at least two or three patients using this nice schema developed by Chad Rich. So let's look at a, a, a typical patient with intermediate risk disease, um, a history of a solitary TA low grade, got mitomycin, now has multifocal TA, uh, WHO grade two, uh, but uh, uh, sorry, WHO 1973 grade two, but the more current uh, classification is low grade. You all recognize the histology and the typical appearance. And this patient really should be treated with intravesical chemotherapy. There is no indication in my opinion, and this is the joint statement that was put out to give this patient BCG. BCG should be held for patients with high grade disease only, or say a patient like this who's gone through other rounds of chemotherapy. Our preference is to use an optimized reg regimen of mitomycin C, which was um, the result of a phase three trial published, as you can see now, almost 20 years ago. In my opinion, it's been the standard of care since then. So the idea is you double the dose and double the concentration of mitomycin, so 40 and 20. If you make the patient NPO after midnight, they're not going to produce as much urine during the two hour dwell time and therefore not dilute the mitomycin. Mitomycin is taken up along a concentration gradient. If you alkalinize the urine, um, the mitomycin is taken up uh, better in an alkaline environment. And then we scan the bladder to make sure that the residual urine is minimal uh, prior to giving the mitomycin. Again, the same reason to not dilute the drug. And what you can see is there's a near doubling of the uh, recurrence-free survival rate at five years with the optimized regimen versus the conventional way of giving it, which at that time was 20 milligrams and 20 cc's. So here's the reference for you down on the bottom right. Uh, and this is the way we give mitomycin. Been doing it this way since the, we were very active in terms of accruing to the clinical trial. So it's a very good drug for this kind of patient. Our guidelines um, still, of course, um, offer BCG or chemotherapy with maintenance as an option. I think most of us are using a monthly maintenance once if we achieve a uh, complete response with intravesical uh, chemotherapy. Uh, the guidelines per se have not really been adapted to the BCG shortage. I think this joint statement is really designed to account for that. Um, now, uh, let's move on to high-risk disease. So this would be a patient who has is BCG naive, uh, 64 years old, three centimeter tumor. If you look on the bottom uh, panel, you see that here, no evidence of hydronephrosis, completely resected, T1 high grade, muscular is appropriate, not involved. Re-resection just showed CIS. So I know that every single person on this call would get the answer to this right, which would be intravesical BCG. So this is who we want to reserve our BCG for. So she has a high risk disease, T1 high grade, residual CIS, classic indication for BCG. This is who we wanna give it to. But if we don't have any BCG, then we can do intravesical chemotherapy. Options would be what I just described, optimized mitomycin C, but I'll come back to this at the end to talk about the current doublet that we're using of gemcitabine docetaxel. And quite frankly, we've had to use this in patients uh, when we've had a BCG shortage, which we fortunately don't have right now in our office. But more importantly, as you know, there's contraindications to BCG and it's a nice regimen to use for those patients as well. Um, this is the classic indication for BCG. And it does have a US FDA approval for both CIS and high-grade TAT1 disease. Of course, as you know, that was 
back in the 1990s. So it's an FDA approved drug. These are the indications of when we have uh, plenty of BCG to, to treat the patients. Fortunately, there's a lot of clinical trials going on. This was, uh, these two slides were also put together by Chad Rich for a panel that we did at the AUA this year. Um, and at least as of a few months ago, you can see where uh, checkpoint inhibitors are moving quickly into this space uh, alone or in combination with BCG. These happen to be combination uh, studies, all in BCG naive patients, um, uh, combining chemo and immunotherapy. Uh, ALT-803 is a synthetic IL-15 uh, analog, which has shown a lot of promise uh, from outdoor bioscience. And I'm going to talk briefly about the SWOG 1602 uh, uh, trial as uh, one that we think may have a potential to get a new strain of BCG into the market. So this is the only slide I'm going to show for that. This is SWOG S1602. The principal investigator is Robert Svatek from UT San Antonio. And Rob and I and many others worked on this for a couple of years, initially with Connaught, uh, but when it was very clear that they were going to stay offline, we turned to uh, the TICE BCG as the control arm. So patients come in who have high-risk disease, high-grade um, otherwise eligible for BCG, um, and uh, they get randomized one-to-one-to-one -to, -one -to, -one to either intravesical BCG or the Tokyo strain, which you may recall is the old Japanese strain, been around and recognized since the 1920s, and actually has very similar activity to Kanad, at least we think so in some comparative studies. And in the two arms that get Tokyo, one of the arms gets primed with intradermal BCG. So the idea is by priming the immune system three weeks before intravesical therapy, um, that boosts the immune system and, and, and gets a more rapid cytokine response. And the primary outcome measure is um, uh, recurrence-free survival at 12 months. So this is a huge study, 959 patients. And we're actually gonna be finished accruing probably by very early in uh, 2021. Um, and, and throughout the pan pandemic, quite interestingly, I know that this is really uh, a, a very important topic. We've been able to continue accrual of 30, 40 patients a month. It's been very safe to treat our patients with BCG during the pandemic. We are tracking COVID-19 infections as, talk, as a, I guess, an adverse event. So hopefully we'll be able to report that uh, at the appropriate time. So the, um, the, there's a potential pathway if we meet a certain bar in patients with CIS that the the, the Tokyo strain could get approved as a result of this trial. Um, but, uh, and we're currently working with the FDA on, um, uh, on that process, but that's not anywhere in the near future, just something that, that is a possibility. Um, uh, now, um, what do we do about the patient who's had induction BCG and recurs um, I, you know, without having had maintenance treatment? So we understand that a lot of patients are gonna get induction only and this was a nice clinical trial that compared gemcitabine versus another round of BCG after BCG failure and showed that gemcitabine was superior in terms of recurrence uh, uh, free survival. You can see a very high recurrence rate, unfortunately, but this did show that gemcitabine actually might be a more effective drug as monotherapy in, in this uh, setting. So that's an option. Um, and I mentioned up front the combination of gemcitabine docetaxel. So this was first reported by uh, Michael Donald's group. Uh, Mike's been a champion of doublet chemotherapy. Um, and uh, most of these patients were pre heavily pre-treated, high-risk disease. And you can see in their small uh, cohort, about half the patients maintained a disease-free state at 12 months and about a third out to 24 and 36 months. Um, and then... Um, um, this, the, the group at Hopkins had a, a similar size a series with similar results. And now just reported in the Journal of Urology just a couple of months ago, uh, several groups got together. We were not part of this. I think MD Anderson was uh, a, a group of about 250 patients um, looking at one and two year recurrence-free survival rates with this uh, doublet. Uh, it was a mix of patients and I believe they all got maintenance. And so you can see here in both uh, CIS and high-grade papillary disease, um, the, the recurrence-free survival uh, looks pretty darn good for a high-risk group of patients. So this is actually the current doublet that we're using when we don't have BCG, and we're also using it in the BCG unresponsive patient population 
who we feel can get another go at intravestical therapy off trial without a clinical, you know, if we don't have a clinical trial, rather than going straight to radical cystectomy. So that brings me to the final topic of radical cystectomy. So this is a, uh, a man in his 50s, had a CT scan with a large tumor, um, <coughs> cigarette smoking history. And I think we all recognize that T1 high grade with the micropapillary variant, which is a, uh, an aggressive variant of high grade cancer, no lymphovascular invasion, and then re-resection also showing T1 high grade. So that's a big red flag for, for getting on with radical cystectomy, particularly in an otherwise young, healthy uh, patient. So the question comes up, so we recommended radical cystectomy. What's the proper extent of the node dissection? I'm not gonna get into that right now. But fortunately, you can see that he had only residual non-muscle invasive disease. And I would uh, say that uh, the cure rate uh, should be very high in a patient like this. So I suspect that most of us would have made the same recommendation, but this is not a patient uh, that you would want to give BCG to, and particularly in an era of a BCG shortage. So we should not hesitate to um, intervene early with radical cystectomy when you have any of these high-risk features, um, large volume, multifocal disease associated with CIS, re-resection showing persistent T1 high grade, and then certainly if there's confirmed evidence of lymphovascular invasion, you can see on the right, a nice study by Daria Tilke. We and others have published on this, uh, showing that lymphovascular invasion is a significant adverse prognostic feature associated with increased risk of occult metastatic disease. And of course, variant histology of which micropapillary is one example of that. Um, the other thing is that in general, um, delaying cystectomy until there's evidence of muscle invasive bladder cancer has a very you lose about 20 to 30% probability of five-year survival. So um, I don't like this term early. I actually call it appropriate timing of radical cystectomy. And I think that many of us are considering this much earlier in the course of the disease, in part maybe based upon our experience of the BCG shortage, but also recognizing that if the, the, you can perform the operation safely, especially with continent diversion in younger healthy patients, the outcomes can be quite good in the long run. So my last slide, um, pardon for the acronym, is um, a very cool thing about BCG that you may or may not be aware of. So um, it turns out that um, uh, BCG vaccination, so we're talking about the TB vaccination, um, is associated with a lot of nonspecific immune effects uh, that can actually provide protection from other viral illnesses and other bacterial illnesses, particularly upper respiratory tract infections. And so the infectious disease community that are experts in BCG vaccination for TB uh, came up with the idea that, that we should do a clinical trial to see if we can prevent or allay the symptom complex associated with um, uh, COVID-19 infection. If you look at the world map, and look at countries that have a national vaccination program compared to those that don't, um, there's about a tenfold increase in both incidence of COVID-19 and mortality with COVID-19 in countries that do not have a, uh, a national vaccination program. So there's a big study that's gone on in the Netherlands, one in uh, uh, Australia, and then there's, there's actually a few studies going on in the US, the one that we're involved in with, is Texas A&M, Baylor College of Medicine, MD Anderson, and UCLA. And actually working with some of the smartest infectious disease brains in the country. So these trials will provide some insights, you know, whether this is gonna be you know, uh, something that'll help prevent this disease. Of course, we don't know yet. And I'm happy to, we'll get on with the program at this point. Uh, so thank you again very much. It's a pleasure and an honor. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get to your questions uh, later in the program. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Lerner, for, for this excellent review on such a complex topic. Now we will proceed uh, to our uh, uh, virtual roundtable and I'm going to open uh, the table for, for questions. Uh, I, I'll remind the audience they can submit questions in English or Spanish at any time. Uh, now I will I would like to invite Dr. Molina to share uh, his view and his experience in the same topic in Mexico. Dr. Molina, please.
Just a moment, I think you are muted, Dr. Molina. Yes. Yes, now I can Dr. hear you. Go ahead, please. You. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Lerner, thank you very much and congratulations for your presentation. I, it's my honor to be your guest in this virtual table. Thank you very much. I, I would like to share you our experience in Mexico, in our hospital, uh, around the topic that we are talking about today, a non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. We, uh, uh, I am going to show you uh, one trial of 45 patients, and we have a follow-up by five years. And thank you very much. This is the objective by the, of our study. Let me review our experience in high-risk non-muscle or uh, bladder cancer with BCG storage. As Dr. Lerner said, we have uh, storage of BCG around worldwide, worldwide, and it's so difficult to get uh, maybe three or four years before. Uh, in Mexico, it's so difficult to get BCG and we should to take another alternatives in order to keep uh, treatment or treat our patients and uh, try to keep them out of uh, recurrence and progression. That, uh, as you can see here, the uh, behavior of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer is usually uh, kind by too many people, but when, when it's uh, of uh, high risk, we have too many problems and we have too many recurrence and progression and we need to take actions to resolve it. And as I said you before, the drug alternatives that we have in Mexico, basically metomycin and, uh, and the other things. Next slide, please. As you can see here, we have uh, 45 patients. We follow by five years with cystoscopy, urine, urine cytology and biopsies. At the moment of diagnosis, the patients, 17.7, 17% were in TAs and 35.4 in TA and 46 in T1. Next, please. All these patients were uh, treated and all they received DCG at the Induction doses and maintenance. Induction was uh, one doses weekly by six weeks and maintenance the one monthly uh, or uh, three week. We apply three doses weekly in three, six, 12 and until three years. Recurrence we can see was almost 29% and people Recur recurrence present 30% when high, high grade and 70, almost 70% 70 in low grade with BCG. And only one patient of this trial have progression to muscle in this disease. Next, please. The current challenge, as uh, Dr. Lerner explained to us before, uh, we don't have BCG available, maybe in too many countries, and we need to use the available BCG in low doses because lower doses have show good responses. We apply 27 milligrams instead 81 as usual, and only apply the induction dose with no intense. We applied one doses weekly for six weeks, no maintenance, therapy, no maintenance therapy, and the recurrence and progression, it's around the first one, 50, and progression 2% are similar than the other results in the different countries. Next, please. The intravesical strategies that we can use, we can take hand of this, Metamycin C apply weekly by six weeks and monthly 12 months. We don't have experience with hemcytabine and uh, with another combination therapy with one before, please. 
one slide up before that, please. Alex, can you load the presentation? Almost the last one. Okay. Next, please. That's it. When we finish the follow-up of uh, that 45 patients without um, complete doses of DCG, we can realize that tumor recurrence was significantly lower with DCG, intravesical application DCG. And there we, not find, we don't find any significant difference between metamycin C or VCG for progression. We can decrease the uh, recurrence, but no progression. There were no significant between, difference between metamycin and VCG for survival and a decision to use either alternative or any agent may base it on adverse effects of each one, availability and cost. And maybe because uh, too many patients are unfit or unwilling, just unwilling the surgery, when we found that kind of patients, we tried to make a combination with uh, too many, two different drugs in order to stop the progression and recurrence. The radical cystectomy is still the first tool that we have to offer our patients that uh, present high risk recurrence or CIS. Then we, we fight every day with uh, this kind of patients we fight every day with this kind of cancers and we try to do as we can do with the resources that we have and we count in every country. At this time, we are used more mitomycin than DCG because the availability is, is shortish. And the results that we observe in our patients are similar that report in the universal literature versus in urology speciality. And the last one, please, next. And this is some reference that we use for the trial. Thank you very much. Very good, Dr. Molina. Thank you so much for your comments. Very interesting data and, uh, and uh, results. Uh, while we welcome uh, questions from the audience and wait, wait for them to submit their questions and their comments, I will start with the first question to uh, Dr. Lerner. And uh, I want to ask if Dr. Lerner wants to share, uh, you know, the challenges in the logistics and the experience on how uh, our practice and other practice have been uh, having in splitting those and combining treatment for two patients or three patients, we know that reducing those, it's, um, it's possible and, uh, and uh, viable from the, from the treatment and clinical standpoint, but uh, how does that work in the real, real practice, Dr. Lerner? Um, so, so there's two, two answers to that, two-part answer. Uh, the first is dose reduction to manage uh, toxicity. Um, so I, I believe, and I think the data supports that, um, continuing uh, maintenance therapy using the SWOG protocol, as I described, is important to maintain uh, the, a complete response long term. Now, certainly not at the expense of um, uh, toxicity to the to the bladder. So, um, I mentioned that you it can be as effective down to one one hundredth of a dose. So our dose reduction strategy is one half, one third, one tenth, one thirtieth, one one hundredth. And we've gone down as low as one one hundredth um, when we have the BCG to manage it. I, I may not have made it clear enough during the, the formal presentation that um, our billing people have told us that um, uh, we cannot bill a patient for a fraction of a vial and then bill another patient for a fraction of the same vial. The fact that there's J codes there are fine, but the, at least in, in our area, um, 
in, in Houston and the region, uh, it's, it, the payers still haven't figured out how to do this from a legal standpoint. Now, Chad Rich, who's in Florida, said they have been able to do it. Um, and it may just mean that, uh, so, so that's still part of the problem. It may not be an issue in other countries and certainly in Latin America. So um, uh, we have not done, use the schema that I outlined. I wanted to put it up there because many do and it's been successful. And I think you have access to the slides if you have questions or concerns about how to do it from a pragmatic standpoint. All right, thank you very much. And Dr. Molina, uh, we've seen a little bit of your protocol and alternatives. Apparently you've been using a lot of mitomycin C in these patients. Uh, have you had an experience uh, combining patients, pairing two or three patients, splitting those between them in Mexico? Do you know any, any practice or anyone has been uh, successful doing that uh, over there? Yes, we, we made uh, some combinations and we try to optimize the available doses that we have. And uh, we try to, I, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yeah, audio seems to Dr. be breaking Lord, up. Dr. Learn. Seems to be breaking up a little okay. bit, Dr. Molina. Yeah, now I think you're back. I lost my audio. Yeah. Can, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Then, yes, the, we we made a combination with docetaxel and mitomycin and try to optimize the available doses in some patients. And we have results, good results with low doses and combined, and combined doses too. We observed that the recurrence is lower and progression is lower, is uh, better lower with good results and patients have a good life quality and we follow up uh, nearly because so many patients feel that, he, that they are out of illness and never back to the hospital. Then we should make an effort to keep in touch with them and bring the hospital at more in this time by the COVID, people are afraid to come to hospitals. Then it's a difficult, it's a difficult uh, issue for us because we need to keep in touch with them by telephone or email and try to convince the patient to come to the hospital for the follow-up. Then I answered the, the question, uh, particular doctor, the only combination that we have and we have experience here is metamycin and, and docetaxel. Okay, okay, very good, very interesting. Thank you for your, your comments. Uh, those are being very challenging times for everyone. Uh, we have a, a question coming from Honduras. Uh, the question is, uh, the COVID decrease, has COVID decreased even more the supply of BCG? I think it has to do with that clinical trial that uh, Dr. Lerner presented at the end. And uh, it's interesting. It's a very, it's a very curious question. And I think a very interesting finding that uh, might have an association there. And uh, this clinical trial is trying to address that question. But every time I mention this trial to someone, they say, well, how is that going to play out with the shortage? Dr. Lerner, have any comments about that? Well, so, okay, so from a patient perspective, uh, there were some concerns raised that, so we have a contract with Merck uh, to supply Tice and the control arm. So you can do the math of 960 patients, that would be 320 and, you know, induction plus maintenance. But if you think about it, um, these patients would be getting BCG off trial uh, if they weren't on this clinical trial. So um, in, in the one sense, it's been a, it's been a, a, a selling point, quite frankly, from the trial because it guarantees access to BCG. Um, and, uh, but I, you know, I, I don't wanna believe that this arrangement that we have, or quite frankly, look, Merck's doing a BCG plus Prembro trial in BCG failure patients, that that is somehow having a negative impact on the supply for the rest of our patients or practices off trial. I, I, I can't obviously, uh, I don't know that that's absolutely true, but I think that Merck has made a really good faith effort to 
in their allocation strategy to, to make sure that uh, uh, assure fairness and distribution of BCG. I, I tell you what my claim is, is that if we as a community um, uh, use BCG as I've, as the joint statement recommends, you know, for the high risk patients and minimize maintenance, say up to a year, um, then that alone will have a, a, a very significant impact on the BCG shortage. It's not gonna solve it, um, but I think that there's some things that we can do to alter our practices. Now, look, if you're in a practice that can't get BCG, forget everything that I just told you. It doesn't really matter. If, you, if, you're, if your shelves are empty, it doesn't matter. There's, as far as you're concerned, there's no BCG. And then you have to do these alternatives that Dr. Molina and I have described. And fortunately, look, there's a lot of good data about intravesical chemotherapy. You've heard about uh, Mito, Gem alone, doublets. Um, and I think it's really kind of fun and exciting as a urologist to be able to use these different combinations and get some comfort around them. And I think you realize that there are some alternatives um, you know, uh, to BCG. Absolutely. Yeah, very good. So um, going on those lines, I think an important message is that uh, we should save during these times of shortage, you should save BCG for the higher risk cases and uh, try to, you know, go towards chemotherapy for the patients with uh, uh, low intermediate risk cancer. So practically speaking, Dr. Lerner, uh, can you share what's your preference of uh, chemotherapy agent in the immediate post-op installation and why? And also uh, in the adjuvant setting, when you have the patients already back in clinic and you're planning induction and maintenance, what's your primary go-to drug in those settings, please? So I didn't show the data, but um, uh, SWOG published a, a randomized trial in JAMA uh, and the randomization was to two grams of gemcitabine uh, versus saline in the perioperative setting. And that, there was a statistically significant reduction in recurrence-free survival. And, uh, and, and I think that we all understand that there's a much lower potential side effect profile with gem compared to mitomycin. So we've switched completely over to gemcitabine in the perioperative period. Um, in the patient that I showed you, you know, with um, typical intermediate risk, so multifocal recurrent TA low grade. Uh, we've used the optimized mitomycin C regimen, as I said, since uh, our participation in the trial, and um, and have a, have I feel like we've had a lot of success with it. Um, and so if if then what happens? And we do monthly maintenance, so out to a year. So then, if a patient's going along and they recur again with intermediate risk disease, then we'll use intravesical gemcitabine um, and, and again, hold out BCG until they develop um, high grade disease. So uh, that would be kind of the preferred uh, sequence of, of treatment. Okay, very good, very interesting. And, uh, and for patients with a high risk, high grade disease, um, would you offer uh, immediate post-op installation of a chemotherapy or, or you, will, you know is already high risk so these patients would need BCG? You would just wait until they recover a few weeks and start the BCG treatment. Yeah, so I'm not convinced that um, perioperative single-dose chemotherapy is going to have a material beneficial effect in patients with high-grade uh, disease who need to get on with BCG. Um, and so uh, the, the obvious question though is you don't always know that that's what you're dealing with, right? So um, I don't think there's any problem with giving perioperative therapy, single dose therapy in that setting, even if you go on to get BCG, there's no harm in that. Um, and uh, so one of the things, and Dr. Godoy is, is the principal investigator of the study, is that we're doing a, a trial where we're biopsying patients in clinic to try to get some information on whether it's low grade, high grade when we go to the operating room and see if that clinic biopsy correlates. So for instance, if I know I've got high grade disease, then I'm gonna go in and you know I've gotta get a TUR in, preferably into muscle. If, I go, if I'm going in with something that's low grade, I'm probably not gonna do that. And then that can also inform decision-making around the use of perioperative chemotherapy. So we're, he's testing that hypothesis in a clinical trial. 
Yeah, it's going to be very, very, very interesting to see those results. Uh, Dr. Molina, we've seen some of your uh, uh, results suggesting your preference for drugs, but do you have any additional comments on what drug we would prefer for the immediate post-op installation and, and how we would you decide and what's the, the drug or the sequencing in, your, in the induction and maintenance uh, protocols later on? We're talking about low intermediate risk disease. Yeah, we, in, uh, we, we prefer to use immediately after the, after the transuretral resection, mitomycin, uh, we can apply in the moment of the surgery. And if, uh, if we don't have uh, BCG, we continue mitomycin therapy and follow up the patient. And if we patient present any any progression or recreation uh, in high grade, obviously we offer the patient the radical cystectomy. Uh -huh. And when, when we have uh, BCG available, we prefer to use BCG after 40 days, the transuretral resection and observe and follow up the patient. But obviously if the patient present a recurrence, high grade, high grade recurrence disease or CIS, we, we suggest the patient take the option, the radical cystectomy by the, by the risk of progression and the, 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 the tumor progression. And uh, some, some patients uh, unwill the surgery and we make a follow, nearly follow up with uh, three years by BCG, apply BCG. And uh, if they present any in progression of the tumor disease, obviously we take the option of radical cystectomy, but no too many patients are convinced of that. Okay, very good. Yeah, I think an important point is that uh, BCG is very responsive and, uh, and a very efficacious in intermediate risk disease, but it's more toxic, there's more side effects. I don't even mention that slide. So uh, we, we started with chemo, especially in these times in this era of uh, a BCG shortage and then leave BCG for the recurrence, or as you mentioned, cystectomy, which is not early, so it's an appropriate indication because at that, at that phase of the disease, you can, you can get very high rates of cure. Very good. We have another uh, question coming from Mexico this time. So the question is, is there any pharmaceutical companies planning on producing BCG in the US or somewhere else? I'll direct that to Dr. Lerner. So maybe, uh, go ahead, sure. Oh, no, 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 go uh, ahead. Thank you, doctor. Maybe as you said, Dr. Lerner, with uh, the promise the BCG may uh, be useful by treatment of COVID, maybe the pharmaceuticals try to make more BCG at this time than before. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good thought. I haven't thought about that. Um, well, so so there's no shortage of BCG for vaccination. I mean, there's many companies that produce this and there is just flat out not a shortage. The, the issue is, is that out of a vial of BCG that we use for intravesical therapy, you can vaccinate 500 subjects. So that's why there's not a shortage for vaccination. Um, so uh, what I'm allowed to say, I, I have a consulting relationship with a company called Verity, uh, which has, um, uh, is trying to bring the Russian strain produced by Serum Institute of India. You've probably heard about the Serum Institute of India in the context of vaccines and COVID-19. They're a huge player. Um, and their first effort is to try to get it approved in Canada. They're gonna have to do a trial uh, uh, to show uh, kind of a supportive data that's out there. They've had multiple conversations with the FDA. I'm serving as a paid consultant for them. So that's my conflict of interest. Um, and that's a, 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 there's a lot of things that have to occur before that could come into the US um, uh, market. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are in discussions with the FDA, although they haven't seen any data, we haven't shared any data from our clinical trial they're interested in the efficacy of the Tokyo strain in the patients with carcinoma in situ. And so um, 
there's a potential, I have to be careful in what I say, potential registration pathway uh, if the data support that. That, that may or may not happen, um, but JBL, the, who, who makes the Tokyo strain, um, has expressed, and they've actually tried to get approval about five years ago and are uh, approaching that as an, on an independent pathway kind of of their own and also in collaboration with us in SWOG. So those, to my knowledge, would be um, the two potential candidates if, you know, if things were to work out. So nothing, but nothing in the near horizon that I know of. What, what's happening though in clinical trials, as you, as you probably saw, is because um, industry recognizes that this BCG shortage is a serious issue. BCG production ha has all sorts of challenges uh, as a live uh, bacteria um, that they've moved very rapidly into this space to develop both um, uh, checkpoint inhibitors uh, alone or checkpoint inhibitors with, uh, with BCG or with other immunotherapy agents. So that's actually kind of exciting and we'll have to see how those trials uh, play out. All right, very good. Yeah, we'll see how this is gonna play out in the future. Um, related to this topic, and I know it might be a whole lecture, a whole session on itself, but uh, somewhat related, I want uh, Dr. Lerner to give us like two minutes quick review on the BCG on responsive criteria. So when the patient has a high risk disease and you start treating with BCG and then uh, uh, the treatment fails, uh, we have a specific criteria for, you know, classify these patients that are unresponsive. And then he went quickly over the options. So Dr. Lerner, very, very brief, please. Uh, the criteria and the main options, maybe what's your best option? I think you mentioned Jim Dosi, but uh, just yeah. wanna hear from you. So there's a publication trail around this if you care to, to look into it. Um, um, but uh, um, the, the definition that we use now, BCG unresponsive disease is a patient that's had induction plus at least one round of maintenance and um, um, either uh, recurs uh, within 12 months with a high grade cancer um, or never clears the bladder. In other words, never responds and then the unique uh, set of patients who have high grade T1 after induction only. So that's the patient population. Uh, as you know, um, valrubicin is approved for BC, what, what then was referred to as BCG refractory CIS. So there's one FDA drug approved for that. And then more recently, pembrolizumab was approved in January uh, for this same patient population. We expect that the interferon, sorry, adenoviral mediated interferon um, uh, and I do have a consulting relationship with that company, um, is, is likely to get approved, uh, we hope quite soon. Uh, Vicinium, which is produced by Vivincia, is before the FDA. They've also been before the FDA for about a few months and we haven't sort of heard what the outcome of that is. So our preference is for a clinical trial. Um, and in the end, if, if we're if right now, we're between clinical trials. So uh, as, as Dr. Godoy mentioned, we're using Gem Dosi. Um, and we've treated now about uh, 30 plus patients. And I think that our data reflect uh, what the published literature uh, provide. Um, and uh, um, logistically, it's a little bit more of an intense regimen, uh, you know, more resources, time in the clinic and all those things that are challenges in a busy urology practice, but um, it can help a patient save their bladder maybe not permanently, but certainly give them a few extra years. And it's particularly helpful for patients who um, are not medically fit for a cystectomy. So that's what we're currently doing. Okay. And, um, and uh, final questions before we start into to adjourn. Do you think the shortage of BCG has resulted in uh, an increased number of cystectomies? I don't think we've seen any, any strong data suggesting that, but I wanna hear your, your opinion, Dr. Lerner, and then Dr. Molina, both of you, please. Yeah, I mean, I think that there was some data along the way when Merck was was out of commission and not producing BCG. I think they've had that. I think that's occurred twice, and I think there were some data to show an uptick in radical uh, cystectomy. What what I'd like to think is that two things have occurred. 
is that as we've gotten a little bit more comfortable using uh, these intravesical agents or clinical trials um, in patients who otherwise we would have done a cystectomy, I think as a community, we're getting a bit better at identifying patients so we can do that safely, at least for you know, a, a, an initial time period to see if we can get a complete response in the bladder. Um, alternatively, we're, you know, we're obviously doing cystectomies in these patients and also uh, figuring that uh, we can do it quite safely. And I showed you the data, Dr. Godoy mentioned it as well. Um, remember that the complete response rate with a radical cystectomy is 100%. There's no drug on the planet that has that. So it's a good operation if it can be done safely in experienced hands um, with very good long-term results. Um, you know, in a patient who has a cystectomy for non-muscle invasive disease, their five-year survival probability is far, is, is, exceeds 90%. And there's really nothing that we have that's as good as that. It, it has a lot of baggage. We all know that, but it's not a bad intervention when used appropriately. So that's kind of my take-home message on cystectomy. Thank you. Dr. Molina, please. Thank you, doctor. Yes, uh, radical cystectomy is uh, the recommend treatment when you have a failure treatment with BCG or any other chemotherapy. Then uh, the surgery in, in expert hands provide patients with um, good quality, with good life quality and they can live without the disease and uh, making a regular life. Then, as Dr. Lerner said, we try to, to be conserved as we can do until the disease can recur or progress. If we, if we uh, see or the patients show any failure of the, in the basic treatment with the BCG or with another chemotherapy agent, we suggest radical prostatectomy and that provide patients a good life quality and a good surveillance. All right, thank you very much. So uh, I'd like to thank our uh, speaker, Dr. Lerner, our panelist, Dr. Molina, Thank you very much for your excellent presentations, your insightful comments and your experience. Uh, I'd like to thank our audience for the great participation and their time. And uh, I'll let Dr. Molina, uh, if you want to make any final considerations about the whole topic, uh, closing comments, and then Dr. Lerner. Dr. Then, Molina first, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we recommend all patients don't uh, don't fail the the follow up and the actually in current visits to his surgeon his urologist in order to avoid recurrence and progression if the patient have a good education about the illness and a good information about the bladder cancer they can make a, a good behavior to fight against it and if we don't have, a, uh, if we have in this moment shortage of BCG, we can uh, take hand the other agents to try to give patients uh, good attention and a good results and with, uh, without, with uh, good survival too. Then my consideration is the bladder cancer is the second cancer in urologists and this so often people should be, should be, uh, with too many attention to any any signs that he can or that people can think uh, could be a bladder cancer and no no take uh, behavior passive behavior and they should go to bed to doctor and make a good diagnosis delaying diagnosis it's equal to delaying treatment and it will be uh, no good results at all. Okay, thank you. Dr. Lerner, final comments, please. Yeah, I think Dr. Molina, that's a great uh, uh, summary uh, message. I mean, we're, we're all open for business. We've been open for business for a long time. We encourage our patients to stay on scheduled treatment. We think it can be done very safely. The one thing I wanna share is that it is a very cool and exciting time to be taking care of these patients. We've got um, 
a much better understanding of the biology of risk stratification of how to use different drugs alone or in combination. Um, I think we really have to use our, our brains, you know, to come up with uh, treatment options in, in the, this, this sort of challenging environment. So I think it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of excitement. I think we can really help most of our patients. And, um, you know, the, the whole field of radical cystectomy has gotten much more sophisticated in terms of the tools we have to make that operation uh, safe as well. And, and we shouldn't hesitate to use it uh, appropriately. Um, and so um, uh, we uh, understand that, that the challenges are different where each of us live and work. And uh, I think both Dr. Molina, Dr. Godoy, myself, the whole team are here. Uh, if you ever want to run a case by or just need some advice or what do I do with this, uh, we're all here to, to help and uh, uh, serve, serve our community. So I want to thank everybody for the opportunity and it's really been a lot of fun. Thank you and thank you both for your time. So before we finish, Baylor St. Luke's would like to recognize and acknowledge the following entities for their support in today's program. Instituto Nacional de Enfermedades Neoplásicas INEN Lima, Peru, Sociedad Peruana de Urología, Asociación Peruana para el Estudio del Cáncer Urológico, Sociedad Mexicana de Oncología ISMEO, Mexico City, Instituto Nacional del Cáncer en Can en Mexico City, Hospital San Javier Medical Education Department Guadalajara, México, QRAP, Quito, Ecuador, Centro de Medicina Integral C Mater Dei, Tegucigalpa, Honduras, Hospital Semesa Medical Education, San Pedro Sula, Honduras, Liga Hondureña contra el Cáncer, San Pedro Sula, Honduras, Hospital Herrera Lerangi, Medical Education, Guatemala City. Lastly, we'd like to invite you all to connect to our 10th virtual roundtable on Thursday, October 1st at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, Houston time, with the lecture Cardiovascular Disease and COVID-19. Dr. Guilherme Silva, Assistant Professor of Medicine and Cardiology and Director of the Structural Heart Disease at Baylor College of Medicine, and with Dr. James Herlihy, Pulmonary and Critical Care Professor of Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine. To receive updates and reminders, please subscribe to CHI St. Luke's Health YouTube. We wish you all a very good night.